This channel is part of the History Hit Network. The 20th century saw the dawn of a new type of warfare. Machines ruled the battlefield. Conventional infantry assault across no man's land was bound to fail. Flesh and blood simply could not get through that type of defense. A fierce arms race led to even more deadly weapons. Those gunners on the tanks had rounds in their cannons, and they were ready to execute if they were told to. Behind the lines, the development of powerful and innovative vehicles meant the difference between victory and defeat. This is absolutely one of the unsung heroes of the Second World War. The relentless pursuit of military supremacy would lead to machines capable of destroying humanity itself. There are very few mistakes you could make that wouldn't have some kind of catastrophic consequence. This time, the Vietnam War and the United States battle to disrupt the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We were after truck convoys, we were after ammunition, we were after soldiers, we were after anything that was moving south. This vital Viet Cong supply line became the target for state-of-the-art American combat machines of the 1960s and 70s. For the Americans, the helicopter was almost made for the Vietnam War. I've been 30 to 50 feet above the trees going 500, 550 knots. They faced a fearsome adversary with less firepower, but with total devotion to their cause. They did it by manpower, and it was amazing. Their dedication to their effort was deep in their heart. Vietnam, Southeast Asia, 1954. Following post-colonial accords, the country is split in two. In the north, the communists, led by Ho Chi Minh. In the south, the government of President Diem, supported by the United States. Then in 1959, communist insurgents, the Viet Cong, begin a guerrilla war against the oppressive South Vietnamese regime. The United States back the South, sending advisors and military supplies with the goal of halting the spread of communism in Asia. The Viet Cong are supported by the North Vietnamese. In 1965, the war escalates. To shore up the struggling South Vietnamese army, America sends nearly 200,000 combat troops to Vietnam. More would follow. As the war expanded, so did the role of a key factor in the conflict, the Ho Chi Minh Trail. This vast supply network leading from North Vietnam to the south would be essential for the success of the Viet Cong. It started as simply a packing party, people with supplies on their backs, following a trail just skirting around the area that separated North and South Vietnam, which was called the Demilitarized Zone. Early on, the trails were little more than jungle paths through neighboring Laos, avoiding the heavily defended Demilitarized Zone. In the early days of the trail, from 1959 for maybe the next two to three years, those who were responsible for getting material down into South Vietnam via Laos had to contend with all manner of hazards. There is disease. Malaria was a great killer. In addition, there are wild animals. There are simply getting lost in the jungle and starving to death. And it's been estimated that between 10 and 20% of those who set out never made it to the other end. During these early years, the journey would take months and could only be carried out on foot or with bicycles. Now, it wasn't possible to use bicycles until the Vietnamese had improved the trail to the extent that the pathways were smooth. 
But once they did that, they could use these bikes to move many more supplies. The record, I think, for the amount of supplies that was moved by a single bicycle was on the order of 800 to 900 pounds. So the bicycles were a mainstay of the supply flow until the trucks came along. The great expansion in the Ho Chi Minh Trail into a veritable jungle motorway really dates from 1965, and there's two reasons for that. That's the year that North Vietnam decides to go for broke to push for a decisive victory in the South, committing its own forces in hitherto unprecedented numbers. And 1965 is also the year that the United States decides to intervene in force to prevent that happening. As the war in Vietnam escalated and the North committed regular army divisions, uh, their old methods of resupply really couldn't cope. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world, from the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era right through to the Second World War. If you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you. We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. In an incredible feat of engineering, the North Vietnamese increased the scale of the network. The numerous routes could now reach further into South Vietnam, and in places, the tracks were widened to fit trucks. However, the North's supply of vehicles was low and their stock old. They needed help. The Russians and the Chinese began to understand that this war against the Americans could uh, sort of undermine one of their enemies, and they became more forthright in supporting North Vietnam, including by providing them with trucks. It was a, a revolution of sorts in the trails logistics flow in 1965 when, in one moment, uh, the North Vietnamese Army committed 2,000 new trucks to specifically supporting the Ho Chi Minh Trail. When you're relying on walking and pushing bicycles, you're covering an average of maybe five to 10 miles max a day. But these trucks by 1966, 67, were covering between 50 and 75 miles a day. And clearly the quantity of war material that can be supplied by truck is massively greater. One of the most widely used of these trucks was the Russian Zul truck. These rugged combat machines would prove their worth on the treacherous Ho Chi Minh Trail. The Zil 131 was a Soviet utility truck. After the Second World War, the Soviet Union made a priority of developing its own robust utility vehicles, which included the Zil 131. Basically a six-wheeled truck designed to go anywhere, move troops, supplies. Conditions could be extremely tough. The Ho Chi Minh Trail was constantly washed away. Uh, the American Air Force was constantly bombing it. The trail was flooded. So the trucks had to put up some pretty tough conditions, as did the drivers. The Zul's 150 horsepower V8 engine gave it a top speed of 50 miles per hour. But more importantly, it was capable of carrying loads of nearly 9,000 pounds over uneven terrain. The 13-inch ground clearance helped it manoeuvre over the rough ground on the trail. We're talking about operating in very wild country, and a truck that broke down could block other trucks behind it. With the expansion of the trail, service stations were set up where trucks could be repaired and troops could be fed and rested. As the trail grew, so did the efforts of US forces to disrupt it. The Americans realized fairly early on the importance of the trail. 1964, 1965, you get the first undeclared American bombing of the trail trying to disrupt what's going on there. It's undeclared because officially Laos is neutral and the United States doesn't want to be openly violating that neutrality.
from 1965 onwards, the American field commander in South Vietnam, General William C. Westmoreland, his strategy is to work towards something that was called the crossover point. The crossover point was the point at which you, America, were killing more of your enemy than your enemy could replace. And therefore, when you've reached the crossover point, you're on your way to victory. The crossover point was to be brought quicker to fruition if you could plug the Ho Chi Minh Trail, if you could plug the drop-off points in the first place in South Vietnam, but beyond that, disrupt or at least retard the functioning of the trail. The thick vegetation made bombing very difficult. And whenever the US Air Force was able to cause damage, it was repaired the next day by a group dedicated to keeping the trail moving. Group 559, which had been formed in 1959 with just about 6,000 personnel, had grown by 1965, 1966 into a group of some 24, 25,000 personnel whose job it was to fill in potholes, to reconstruct bridges, to redirecting the trail as and when is necessary to keep this trail going. Undeterred, the United States military believed it could significantly disrupt the trail and isolate the Viet Cong by bringing its vast technological supremacy to bear. It began to introduce formidable combat machines. One would become an icon of the Vietnam War. The UH-1 Iroquois helicopter, or simply the Huey. There is a soundscape to that war. It is the whir of chopper blades. You could hear a Huey from a mile away. Its particular sound is so recognizable. It's a wop, wop, wop. That is famous, even today. Vietnam, Southeast Asia, 1966. The Vietnam War had intensified. Vital supplies were coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to support the Viet Cong's fight against the South Vietnamese and American forces. The Americans began attacking the trail and its drop-off points, employing their latest combat machines. The most important of these was the UH-1 Huey helicopter. For the Americans, it was a helicopter war for the simple reason that you had to get your troops across and around some very inhospitable terrain. Mountains, paddy fields, jungles. The helicopter was almost made for the Vietnam War. Built by the Bell Company, the first prototype of the Huey flew in October 1956. The Army ordered 183 of the HU-1s. HU stood for Helicopter Utility, giving rise to the nickname Huey. The first model came off the production line in 1961 and was redesignated UH-1, but the name Huey stuck. Powered by a 1,400 horsepower turbo shaft engine, it had a maximum speed of 130 miles per hour, a ceiling of 12,700 feet, and a range of 350 miles. Also, uh, this is 43, be advised, uh, they have a one. The UH-1 was a utility helicopter from day one. Its main use was a battlefield taxi, taking troops into action, bringing them back. It's so versatile, it was used for medivac, bringing the injured back, taking medical supplies out. It could be quickly changed from a medivac unit into a rocket carrying or a gunship. The UE has a jet engine, but unlike a fixed-wing aircraft, it is not giving you forward thrust. Instead, it produces shaft power to turn the rotor blades. The engine turns the main drive shaft, which enters the transmission. This distributes the power to the main rotor mast, as well as delivering power down an additional drive shaft to the tail rotor via smaller gearboxes. It's got a fantastic lifting capacity. It will lift just short of two tons, so your average Jeep, it could actually pick one of them up and carry it to the front line. 
7,000 Hueys would see service in the Vietnam War. This was nearly half of the overall production number of 16,000, making it the United States' most produced helicopter. Of the 7,000 Hueys that went over to Vietnam, nearly half were lost, and those that made it back bear the scars of battle. In Vietnam, in combat, the Huey used to take lots of hits. In this particular helicopter, you'll see that the molded patches is where the rounds have actually come up through the floor of the machine and gone out through the roof. And the only protection for the pilot and the co-pilot was that they had bulletproof seats. The guys in the back had no protection at all. The main control systems are fairly simple on the Huey. We've got the collective over there, which actually gives the force on the blades and gives us the lift and actually asks for more power from the engine or less power. The side click here gives the directional control, left, right, forwards or backwards. And we've got the, both pedals down there, the anti-torque pedals, which stop the body from spinning. The versatility of the Huey meant it would be used in many ways to help disrupt the Ho Chi Minh Trail. From dropping observers and commandos into Laos to lending air support to troops tasked with interdicting it. Alan Waseleski was a lieutenant commander in the US Navy with the Huey gunship outfit Helicopter Attack Light 3, nicknamed the Sea Wolves. The toughest mission I flew was on March 9th, 1968. An army battalion were going in to theoretically stop a supply train coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Led by American advisors, the South Vietnamese battalion was ambushed by a large hidden force of Viet Cong fighters. Many South Vietnamese were killed. This is Warden Warden, Scramble Sewell. Allen's Huey fire team was scrambled to assist and provide the remaining troops with covering fire. An army lieutenant by the name of Jack Jacobs, and he had an American sergeant radio man with him. And he was in the lead company that got hit with a barrage of mortars. We got there in about 10 minutes, circled the area, saw the mortar attack, asked Jacobs where he was at, and he said, forget it, and we're being overrun. It's so hot down here, you're not going to be able to save us and survive. And I said, well, hang on, let me take a look at this. So we tried to locate all the enemy positions, but they were well dug in and hidden in tree lines. So I decided it was time to go in. And uh, I took my fire team in where Jacobs was. And as we made the approach, I tried to go in for a landing. My wingman was trying to cover me. And we hit a barrage of automatic weapons fire. Green tracers coming at us. I tried three penetrations to get in, and I kept getting shot up. So finally, I decided to get down on the ground. I flew around, got underneath the tree levels, and flew underneath the foliage, and had Jack pop smoke. He did. And I plopped into a hole where he was, and we managed to pick them up. Was Saleski's extraordinary feat of courage and skill, and the Huey's maneuverability in tight areas saved Jacob's life. To fly a Huey underneath the canopy is something that's not to be done. You're in danger of lifting up and engaging your rotor blades with the foliage in the trees or the jungle around you. That was the last option to make sure these guys were going to live. After picking up the two injured Americans and one seriously wounded Vietnamese soldier, Alan's Huey was now heavily laden. I had to bounce getting forward translational lift before the helicopter would really fly. So there I go across the paddy, through the trees and all the brush, but we finally made it out. Now we were taking fire every moment that we were in that area. My helicopter had well over 150 holes in it. You don't have the feeling of fate until after everything's over. 
And then you begin to shimmer and shake because you wonder, how the hell did I make it through this? For his actions that day, Allen received the Navy Cross, the United States military's second highest decoration for valor. Although not all rescue missions ended in success, the soldiers on the ground knew that the arrival of the Hueys greatly increased their chances of survival. When troops are engaged in battle and they have significant casualties, they don't know if they're going to make it or not. But when they can hear the wop, 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 wop of a Huey helicopter, they know that there's a chance. God help us. There's a chance we can be rescued. And generally, that's what happens. Although they would conduct a variety of the missions, the Seawolves' main objective was to fly in support of another of America's combat machines, fast patrol boats. Our mission with the river patrol boats was control the superhighways of Vietnam. The rivers, all the estuaries, that's how they transport everything. Their food, their supplies, their people, anything they need. To try to put a stop to this, the Americans launch Operation Game Warden, and with it, the PBRs. These small, versatile fiberglass hull boats would be tasked with patrolling the rivers of South Vietnam. From 1965, South Vietnamese and American forces desperately fought to disrupt the North Vietnamese supply lines supporting the Viet Cong. At times, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was bringing around 4,500 troops per month and 300 tons of supplies per day to the combat areas in the south. Alongside the Ho Chi Minh Trail on land, the United States also had to deal with maritime traffic and also river traffic, the alternative means by which the North Vietnamese sought to get supplies into South Vietnam. From 1966, as part of Operation Game Warden, the task of patrolling these water highways fell on the PBRs, short for Patrol Boat River. 250 of these vessels were sent to Vietnam to patrol the Mekong Delta and the river systems around South Vietnam to disrupt the Viet Cong's supply of weapons and contraband. But the PBRs were themselves constant targets for the enemy. At times, we would be within 50 or 60 feet of the riverbank. The likelihood of being shot at if we were in a free fire zone was fairly great sometimes. We were quite vulnerable on the rivers and canals. We never knew where the enemy was. They always knew where we were especially if we were headed up the canal or up the river and they were crossing with munitions, personnel, and things like that. They would ambush us to keep us from getting there. The PBRs had one key asset which would help protect its four-man crew, speed. The boat is basically simple. There weren't a lot of fancy electronics that we had to monitor. We have two V6 diesel engines. When we were running the boats, we would not typically run them at a slow speed. If we're transiting someplace, it's generally full throttle. And what happens with this type of hull is it planes up to a point where as you're going faster and faster, the front of the boat is lifting out of the water. So we could actually run in water that was about a foot deep. The PBRs could reach a maximum speed of over 30 miles per hour thanks to two pump jet drives. These worked by sucking water in from under the boat. The pumps in the boat increased the pressure of the water. The nozzles at the back would then expel this as a high velocity jet stream. And the way the boat was steered is that these nozzles swivel from side to side. 
There's no rudders, no propellers, nothing to get hung up on underneath the boat. It was very, very maneuverable. The boats could actually turn 180 degrees in their own length from full speed. They were that maneuverable. Ambushes on PBRs were frequent, and the crew had to always be vigilant, manning the 50 caliber machine guns on the front and rear of the boat. You always had your head on a swivel. You were always looking for the possibility of being ambushed. It was very rare that we weren't on alert or really paying attention. It was this vulnerability that brought about the introduction of the Seawolf Hueys as close air support for the PBRs. When you have a couple of PBRs and you've got jungle on the side, funny things happen. People can hide in the jungle on the side and ambush the boats. Well, the chief of naval operation realized, hey, we've got to get a third dimension in there. We need our own air cover. We would respond to any time the boats got into trouble. Our mission was to keep them safe. We typically called in support from the Hueys when we were in trouble. It was rare to call them when we were not in a firefight. These boats, as you can see, are not heavily armed, so we could not stay and fight toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody firing at us from the shore. What we would typically do is try to get out of the line of fire. Turn forward, 180. Frequently, when they got so wounded or hit where they explode, we would go in and rescue them. And that was a situation with Gandhi. Jerry Gandhi was a PBR captain. In February 1969, he was on patrol on the Vinh Thai Canal in South Vietnam. The Vinh Thai Canal separates Vietnam from Cambodia. And our mission was to stop the Viet Cong from resupplying from Cambodia because that was one of their main ways of getting munitions in the country. I was boat captain of the second boat in a two-boat patrol, and we were rounding a bend in the river, and then the port side of the canal just opened up in flame and automatic weapons fire. The lead boat was hit and just burst into flame. Seconds later, Jerry's boat was hit. But instead of trying to escape the fire zone, Jerry decided to take his badly damaged PBR and deliberately maneuver it into the line of fire to protect the stricken boat ahead of him. I saw four crew members it, beside the boat, and they were using their boat to protect them from the incoming fire. They were in the most horrible condition I've ever seen. I don't know how any of them were alive. But I managed to get two of them into my boat. The third one, we got into the boat. The patrol officer was so badly injured that he couldn't get aboard my boat. So I went over the side into the water. Once I was there, I realized that I couldn't get him up on the boat. So I just instinctively sunk to the bottom of the canal, got his two feet on my shoulder, and I came up, and when I did, I pushed him over into the boat. Jerry was able to get his damaged craft and injured comrades out of the fire zone. The Seawolf Hueys arrived to take the wounded to safety. One more example of how the PBRs and the Hueys worked together to save lives. I would dare say that there's not a PBR crewman who would be here today were it not for the helicopters. I get excited today when I hear the wings of a helicopter frapping. It always take me back. I'll never forget, never forget that. Thousands of others were not so fortunate. Men of valor, men of courage, men of country. We don't remember them as people who are gone. 
we remember as people that are with us now, like we all came back. While the Americans and South Vietnamese had some success controlling the rivers, they were less successful in plugging the Ho Chi Minh Trail. Their bombardment was too imprecise and scattered to inflict lasting damage on the crucial supply route. The American bombing of the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos in the mid to late 1960s was fairly brutal, but it was also somewhat random. You've got a three-tiered jungle canopy. It is very, very difficult to penetrate. A more targeted approach was necessary. And again, the Americans turned to their superior technology to achieve their objective. They began dropping sensors aimed at narrowing down target sites throughout the jungle and along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. By marshalling the data and looking at the readouts from all the sensors, the commander of the 7th slash 13th Air Force was able to focus the assets on the places where uh, the enemy was known to be passing. So for example, if a whole North Vietnamese division was coming down the Ho Chi Minh Trail on trucks, the commander of the Air Force could send the bulk of his MISTI forward air controllers to that point where the trucks were expected to pass. MISTI was the call sign of a unique group of fighter pilots. Their task, flying low over the jungle canopy, looking for targets along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. The aircraft they flew was the F-100 Super Sabre. We were after truck convoys, we were after ammunition, we were after soldiers, we were after anything that was moving south to attack our American troops and South Vietnamese troops in South Vietnam. Could there be any prettier airplane than this? Well, I tell you, aerodynamically and beauty-wise, there's none to beat it. Brings back a lot of memories just to look at. Yep. By the late 1960s, the United States had sent half a million troops to fight in Vietnam. If the US and South Vietnam were to win the war, they knew they had to disrupt the vital North Vietnamese supply lines to the Viet Cong along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. In 1967, F-100 MISTI missions to seek out and mark key targets on the trail began flying out of Phu Cat. Well, we flew the F-100F, which is the two-seat version. And we flew with 335-gallon uh, refuelable drop tanks. And then outboard, we had two LAU-19 rocket pods with seven uh, rockets on each side so that we could fire rockets to mark the targets. Our job was not to attack the targets. Our job was to linger long enough that we could find the targets, call for fighters, and then when the fighters are en route and we made contact with the fighters, we would roll in, mark the target, and then the fighters would basically drop the bombs. These FAC, or forward air controller missions, were initially carried out by propeller-driven aircraft, but these proved easy prey. The North Vietnamese were deploying more and more defenses down into the south, more and more anti-aircraft guns and even surface-to-air missiles. So basically, the propeller-driven aircraft were getting shot out of the sky. They couldn't survive. And so they needed a jet aircraft that was faster and they could survive. They picked the F-100 because that was the most available. The F-100 Super Sabre was introduced into service in 1954. This versatile aircraft would fulfill a number of roles in the Vietnam War, but it was the two-seater version, the F-100F, that were assigned to the Misties. This allowed for a second pilot as an extra spotter. This, and their ability to fly faster than the speed of sound, was what made them ideal for this new target spotting role. When you first do it, the first five rides on a MISTI mission are in the back seat. And that's where the older guys take you up and show you what to look for and help you acquire your, quote, MISTI eyes of being able to see stuff. 
We became experts at locating camouflage targets, things that stood out, the different colors, different shapes and what have you. In other words, it didn't fit in with the jungle. A lot of bridges were actually underwater and you'd only see, oh, maybe that much water flowing over something. When the Misties did spot a potential target, they would line up for another flyover at a much lower altitude to verify what they had seen. I've been 30 to 50 feet above the trees going 500, 550 knots. All right, guy in back, get ready, get your camera. It's gonna be on the right. I'm gonna make sure it's on the right. I'll call you three, two, one, take the picture. And then immediately we'd go for altitude to get out of the small arms. The North Vietnamese first defended the trail using machine guns like the Russian Gashniki. And over time, their air defenses became more sophisticated. They began to deploy 37 and 57 millimeter anti-aircraft. Misty pilots had to apply all their skills to avoid getting shot down, often employing jinking maneuvers. These maneuvers were the sudden, rapid displacement of the aircraft's flight path in three axes, yaw, pitch, and roll. These were used at random intervals to confuse the enemy and making them harder to hit. But it wasn't foolproof. 34 Misties were shot down. The Misty mission was a very, very difficult mission. We flew at low altitude for long periods of time, exposed to gunfire the whole time we were flying, and we lost a lot of airplanes. 28% of our uh, pilots were shot down, some of them twice. It was extremely difficult, very high loss rates, and we did not accomplish our mission. The reason was we couldn't do it. We couldn't hit what we were after because we didn't have precision weapons. I found a Caterpillar tracked vehicle repairing a, uh, a road. We marked the target but because it's all steel, you gotta hit it directly to kill it. And in those days, we didn't have precision guided weapons. It took us four days and at least 50 sorties dropping bombs to kill that one caterpillar. Furthermore, Misty missions could only fly during the day, so many North Vietnamese trucks traveled by night. In May 1970, after 21,000 combat hours, the Misty operations were ended. The losses were too great. But the tactics pioneered by the 157 Misty pilots are still used in modern warfare. Just as Misty missions were ending, the North Vietnamese began to further reinforce their air defenses along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We shouldn't suppose that the North Vietnamese were entirely devoid of technology themselves. Courtesy of the Soviet Union, they had plenty of surface-to-air missiles, which by the late 1960s made North Vietnam's air defenses pretty formidable. The most feared by American pilots was the Russian SA-2 Guideline missile. The SA-2, which is the NATO codename, which was known by the Russians as the S-75 Divina, was developed in the late 1950s as a high-altitude air defence missile. The missile's primary role was to tackle the US B-52 strategic bomber and what it considered quite a nuisance, the U-2 spy plane. Flying at twice the cruising altitude of commercial aircraft, at a height of over 20,000 metres, the US believed their U-2 spy planes were out of reach of Soviet-made air defences. But the SA-2 could reach 25,000 metres and travel at nearly four times the speed of sound. It could deliver a 430-pound fragmentation warhead that shredded anything within its 270-metre blast radius. Although America committed no ground troops to fight in North Vietnam, they did engage in relentless bombing missions on sites in the north, including the capital, Hanoi. 
The North Vietnamese wanted the missile. Moscow was slightly reluctant to hand it over for fear, of course, that if it fell into American hands, they would be able to develop countermeasures. But eventually, Moscow acquiesced in Hanoi's request, and they first were detected in North Vietnam in 1965. It wasn't until 1971-72 that SA-2 complexes were actually in Laos and supporting the trail. By about 1972, the Ho Chi Minh Trail was being defended by an air defense complex of sophistication comparable to what was being employed in North Vietnam itself. Although the Americans were able to devise countermeasures relatively quickly, the SA-2 still proved important to North Vietnam's efforts to get America out of the war. The SA-2 actually proved to be of greater political significance ultimately than actual tactical, uh, simply because the Americans very rapidly developed uh, countermeasures. And this meant that they were firing 10, 20 missiles to bring down a single aircraft, so they were not terribly effective. The point is, of course, that all they needed to do for public relations purposes was to shoot down a single aircraft, um, and it caused the Americans problems. The image of a downed aircraft, a symbol of America's military might, would add to the growing war weariness in the United States. Although the combat machines deployed by either side in Vietnam contributed hugely to the intensity of the conflict and the loss of life, they never ultimately proved decisive. Some 20 years after the end of the war, Robert McNamara, who was Secretary of Defense under Kennedy and later under Johnson, admitted, frankly, he put his hands up. He said that America's technological prowess, its advantage, its reliance on high-tech military kit turned out to be not the advantage it might have been given that what the United States was up against was a highly motivated, ideologically driven, committed enemy with a real cause to fight for. They did it by manpower. And it was amazing, their dedication to their effort was deep in their heart. In March 1973, after 58,000 Americans and millions of Vietnamese had been killed, the United States pulled the last of its combat troops out of Vietnam. South Vietnamese forces were left to fight on alone. The Vietnam War eventually ended in the spring of 1975 when North Vietnamese and Viet Cong forces essentially captured all of South Vietnam, marching into Saigon, where you have the iconic image of the Americans fleeing South Vietnam with some of their Vietnamese allies in helicopters from the US Embassy. There is a, a kind of irony. There was a helicopter at the height of the war. There is the helicopter ferrying the last American ambassador out of Saigon. There is a, a kind of emblem, a symbol of American technological prowess, but technology which America had in abundance didn't help America win this war. Over the course of the Vietnam conflict, the United States dropped two million tons of bombs on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, using their most sophisticated combat machines to try and disrupt it. Despite this bombardment, the North Vietnamese managed to build one of the most impressive supply networks in military history. A jungle trail which had taken three months to navigate became a jungle highway that could deliver supplies to anywhere in South Vietnam. The Vietnamese who made this possible paid a heavy price. There are 72 military cemeteries lining the Ho Chi Minh Trail, containing the remains of those who built and maintained it, and helped their nation defeat the might of America. <laughs>